Okay, so today's lesson is going to be a continuation of what we did last class, of course, on uh, electromagnetic radiation. We're going to talk today about the speed of light and how it could be calculated. Um, and of course, light is a form of electromagnetic radiation, so that is where we're connecting it. So here's today's plan. We're going to look at the ways in history where scientists attempted to calculate the speed of light today. We'll have a few sample problems where we imitate those methods ourselves, and you can actually try them first if you like. So in other words, you can pause this video when we get to those, give them a try on a piece of loose leaf, and then watch how I go over them if you wish. Uh, if you don't want to do that, you don't have to. And then, of course, we'll get some practice time in as well. Uh, we're going to continue to use the EMR Part 1 Notes booklet, which is found, again, on Google Classroom, if you wish to use that as a reference. I would highly advise using it as a reference. At the very least, the, the sample, or sorry, the practice problems that we are assigning each day are found in that EMR part one note booklet. So you will have to be accessing it at some point. Uh, but anyway, let's get started here. So the speed of light. One property of EMR, electromagnetic radiation, is that it all travels at the same speed, the speed of light. Now the speed of light is often denoted by the letter C. Sometimes we use the letter V instead just for velocity, but C in particular is referring to the speed of light. It's 3.00 times 10 to the eight meters per second. Because this speed is so incredibly fast, it is difficult to uh, measure accurately, right? So it's hard to actually directly measure the speed of light. It took a long time before people were able to actually do this. So there were numerous attempts in history to record the speed of light. Some methods were more accurate than others. Moving on. So Galileo was actually one of the first people that tried to uh, measure the speed of light. Uh, Galileo and his assistant stood on hilltops one kilometer apart. They held covered lanterns, so lanterns that were covered in something, and then they would cover or uncover them when they saw the other person cover uh, or uncover their lantern. So as one lantern was opened, the other person would open their lantern as soon as the light from that lantern arrived, right? And they knew the distance between the two hilltops, one kilometer, of course, uh, and they tried to measure the speed from that. Now, Galileo couldn't accurately measure the speed of light this way at all. Not really a big surprise there. His, his methodology was a little bit flawed. Um, but he did try and he made a lot of notes uh, regarding that. So moving on. Uh, Romer and Hugens, I believe is how that's pronounced. I could be incorrect, but you know what pronunciation, who cares right now? They lived uh, about between 1644 and 1710. Don't remember if that was Romer or Hugens, but uh, whatever. Uh, they used the known orbital period, which is the time taken for a complete orbit, of Jupiter's moon Io. They compared that period to the period observed when Jupiter was at its maximum and minimum distances from Earth. In other words, what they did was, when Jupiter was at its furthest distance away from Earth, they watched Io through a telescope, one of its moons, right? And they watched how long it took Io to complete a period, so to complete one orbit around Jupiter. And then they waited for when Jupiter was at its minimum distance from Earth, so its closest point to Earth, and then they did the same thing. Uh, through this, they actually noticed there was a difference in time, at least relative to what we were seeing, uh, and they calculated the speed of light this way to be 2.3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second, which is relatively close. I mean, that yes, they're off by quite a lot there, but at least it was a good beginning estimation for what the speed of light would be. And you have to keep in mind, this was over 300 years ago. Uh, Foucault is the next one. Foucault lived from 1819 to 1868. He used a spinning toothed wheel with a light source and some mirrors. Light reflected through the wheel, so through the little teeth in the, in the wheel, uh, to a mirror that he'd positioned 8.63 kilometers away, and then it returned. Foucault adjusted the wheel until light would pass through. So in other words, the little teeth on the wheel, and you can see that in this picture just down below here, uh, the teeth on the wheel would block the light if the um, rotational period of this wheel wasn't set exactly perfect. Because remember, light was coming, bouncing through this, um, you know, toothed uh, wheel, uh, go all the way these 8.63 kilometers away to this mirror, then bounce all the way back while this thing is rotating the whole time. Uh, and then he tried to observe to see whether or not he was able to see the light passing through, right? So using this, he actually got really close. He got 3.15 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. So he did get really actually quite close to measuring the speed of light this way. Now the last way we're going to look at is Michelson, who lived from 1852 to 1931. He used something very similar to Foucault, except he set up the mirrors in an octagon and then placed the distant mirror way further away than Foucault did at 35 kilometers away. If light completed the trip when the octagon made a one-eighth turn, because of course there's eight sides to it, so if it made one-eighth turn, uh, it could be detected. Uh, in other words, the only way that the light from the light source could be detected is if it bounced back exactly as this rotating octagon made one eighth of a turn. 
or two eighths of a turn or three eighths of a turn, as long as it had an actual properly uh, angled side to it right as the light is coming and striking it, then that's how we knew it was going to work just fine, right? Um, so he adjusted the frequency of the spinning octagon until the light was seen. So he just changed how fast this thing was spinning just until the point where the light was first seen. So with this method, he was able to calculate the speed of light to be 2.98 times 10 to the 8 meters per second, which was outstandingly close. He did a very good job, uh, especially given that he did this over 100 years ago. Um, let's do some examples here. Now, again, if you want to try these examples on your own, you can pause here, jot them down, give it a shot, and then see how I go about them. But otherwise, we're going to go through these together right now. Uh, if a spacecraft is located at a distance of 1.25 times 10 to the 12 meters away from Earth when a signal is sent to it, how long after the signal is sent will it return? So in this question, we're assuming we know the speed of light. So, whoops, sorry, I didn't mean to click forward. There we go. We know the speed of light. We can say velocity or C, depending on whatever letter you want to use here, is 3.00 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. Now, we're looking for how long, so we're looking for a time, that's our unknown here, and our distance is known, but you gotta be careful here. For the signal to be sent and returned, it has to make this distance going to the satellite, or to the spacecraft, sorry, uh, and then return back. So in other words, the distance isn't this, it isn't just 1.25 times 10 to the 12, it's 1.25 times 10 to the 12 times two, because it has to go there and back. Or in other words, that would be 2.5, times 10 to the 12 meters. So we have velocity, we have a distance, we have, uh, or rather we're looking for time. Uh, light does not accelerate, it stays at the constant velocity of the speed of light, right? So we can use the constant velocity formula V equals D over T. Or in other words, we can say 3.00 times 10 to the eight equals 2.50 times 10 to the 12 divided by T, so to solve for t, we just have to times it over and then divide by 3.0 times 10 to the 8. Bottom line is the time that you get is actually going to be 8.33 times 10 to the 3 seconds. Now, that, of course, is 8,000 something seconds. That's not really easy to wrap our head around. So if you divide that by 60, you could also change this. And I know the question didn't ask for it, but just, just so you have it. You could also change this again to three sig digs uh, to 139 minutes. Uh, which is a lot easier to wrap your head around, or if you uh, prefer to put that in hours instead, you could divide that by 60 as well, and say that T is equal to about 2.31 hours. So any of those units work just fine. Seconds is the standard way, but just for our own understanding, um, that might be a little bit better, right? Anyway, moving on. So the radius of the Earth's orbit is 1.49 times 10 to the 11. <clears throat> Excuse me. Whoa. Assume Romer and Hugens made an initial observation of Jupiter's moon when the Earth was at its closest to Jupiter, and a second observation six months later, which of course would be when Earth is at its furthest from Jupiter. Well, that's a little bit of a simplification, but you know, we'll just pretend. Now, if the appearance of light from Jupiter's moon was 22 minutes later during the second observation, what was the calculated speed of light? This one's a lot tougher. If you want to pause and give it a try, go for it. But here's where we're going to go with this. Um, first things first, I want to kind of say that the time difference here of 22 minutes later is important because that's how long the light takes to travel that additional distance, okay? Now, by additional distance, we have to think about what's really going on here. We're talking about six months later. If you think about Earth's orbit around the sun, let's say this right here is the sun, and Earth is orbiting around the sun in an orbit like so. So as good as the circle as I can do with this pen tablet thing. Uh, this is Earth in one month. So Earth here. Six months later, Earth is now over here. Now, we will assume uh, that Jupiter is remaining in its same relative position. Again, this is an oversimplification, but we, we, can, we can make this reasonable assumption for now. We can assume, though, um, that since we're looking at the same place, let's say way over here, but the only thing that's changing here is the distance away uh, Earth is from that object, from uh, Jupiter's moon, right? So we know uh, Earth's orbit has a radius of 1.49 times 10 to the 11 meters. That would be this distance here from the sun to the Earth is 1.49 times 10 to the 11 meters, right? So what I'm trying to get at here is this 22 minutes is how long it takes 
for the light to travel that additional distance, or in other words, twice Earth's radius. So from this time to this time, with you know that much difference of time, that is how long it took the light to travel that full distance. So if we're gonna calculate the speed of light this way, we have to assume that we don't know it. We have to assume it isn't at 3.0 times 10 to the eight. So we just have to calculate it the same way that Romer and Hugens did this. So we can say that V is equal to distance over time. We're looking for velocity. We technically know our distance here. It's gonna be twice Earth's radius. And we also know our time, it's 22 minutes. 22 minutes though, let's turn that into seconds by times and by 60, that's 1,320 seconds. And that distance, let's actually times that distance by two. So our distance is actually going to be uh, 2.98 times 10 to the 11 meters. Throw that into this formula here. So V equals 2.98 times 10 to the 11 divided by uh, yeah, 1320 seconds, so meters over second. Uh, this is actually going to give you to, to just two sig digs, because again, we had 22 here, so just two sig digs, 2.3 times 10 to the eight meters per second. So what we've done in this question is we've just imitated the way that Romer and Hugens would have done this themselves. It's not the most accurate way, obvious. There's a lot of, um, some very big assumptions that are coming with this, hence why they didn't quite get it right. Uh, but still, it is uh, worthwhile to know. Moving on, Mickelson. If Mickelson used an eight-sided mirror to measure the speed of light, which he did, but you know you could change it to a six-sided mirror or a 10-sided mirror or a 12-sided mirror or whatever you want to do. But if you use an eight-sided mirror to measure the speed of light and obtain an image when the mirror was rotating at 6.10 times 10 to the two RPS, that's rotations per second, Remember, uh, rotations per second, it's just another way of saying hertz. It's kind of silly that they changed it around, but whatever, 10, point, or 10 to the power of two uh, hertz there. Uh, what is the calculated speed of light if the mirror was placed 30 kilometers from the mirror? From the mirror? Okay, well, I, oh, I guess, oh, the other mirror, I see what I was, okay, so if the other mirror is placed 30 kilometers away from the eight-sided mirror, that's what I really should say. Sorry, that even confused me. I was like, what on earth are we talking about here? Uh, bottom line is we, uh, we know a few things. We, we know uh, how far away that mirror is. So we know eventually we're going to get into this formula here, V equals D over T. And because the light has to go to the mirror and back, we know our distance is going to be 60 kilometers, or in other words, 60,000 meters. We're trying to calculate the speed of light. So in order to finish this equation off, we're going to need to figure out a time. Now, your time is going to have to come from this mirror. This is its rotations per second, 6.10 times 10 to the two, or in other words, 610 hertz. So in other words, this thing is spinning around 610 times per second. So like this thing is just whipping, right? It's going pretty quick. Uh, now that's a full rotation, like 610 full rotations per second is what that's doing. So what would be useful is if we realize we have the old formula time period, is equal to one over the frequency, okay? The time period tells us how long it takes in seconds to make one rotation, not 610 rotations, just one rotation. So if we say T equals one over 610, that actually gives us T equals a really messy decimal, 1.6393 times 10 to the negative three seconds. Again, that's how long it takes to make just one rotation, just one spin around, okay? Not very much time at all, very, very quickly. Now, that's one full rotation, one full rotation. Keep in mind with Mickelson's experiment, he was only rotating it one eighth of a turn because it's an eight-sided mirror. Now, if this was a 10-sided mirror, it'd be one tenth of a turn. If it was a six-sided mirror, it'd be one sixth of a turn. But we only care to actually rotate this one eighth of a turn. So we just need to take this and times it by one eighth because we only want to rotate it one eighth of a turn. If you don't want to times by one eighth, you could also divide by eight. It's the exact same thing. Either way you do it though, one eighth of a rotation is going to be 2.0492 times 10 to the negative four seconds. And that's how long it takes for a one eighth rotation. Bottom line is, since we are observing the light, right, he obtained an image when the rear mirror was rotating at that RPS, right, that hertz, right, um, 
since we made that observation, we know we have this amount of time that it takes for the light to travel 600 or six, 60,000 meters. Uh, and therefore we can figure out a velocity, right? So we can say velocity is 60,000 meters. That's how long it traveled to that other mirror and back uh, when it only made a 1 8 rotation, which is just 2.0492 times 10 to the negative four. And that's in seconds, of course. Meters over seconds should give you meters per second. If you throw this in your calculator, you're going to find that the calculated speed of light this way is 2.93 times 10 to the eight meters per second. Wow, a lot more accurate than the other ways. So good, awesome, moving on to the next one. Uh, in a recreation of Nicholson's experiment, a 12-sided mirror, so see, here we go, now we're not using just a, uh, an old eight-sided mirror. A 12-sided mirror was able to rotate at 525 hertz. How far away should the fixed mirror be placed in order to produce an image through the apparatus? Uh, in this question, we have to assume the speed of light is what we are always given. So we need to make that assumption that V is 3.00 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. We're not looking for the speed of light in this question. We're looking for how far away the object is. Now, how far away the object is is going to be related to D. Remember, D is actually how long it's, or how far it's going to travel going to the mirror and back. So as long as we remember whatever answer we get for D, we, we just have to divide it by 2 so that we can just find how far away to place the mirror from the rotating 12-sided mirror. Anyway, long story short here, we know what our frequency is. Once again, frequency isn't really useful in these equations because the equation we generally use is just the simple V equals D over T. Maybe we should find the time period, how long it takes for this 12-sided mirror to rotate once. Well, the time period is one over the frequency. So the time period here is one over 525, or in other words, as a uh, decimal, 1.90, four, seven times 10 to the negative three seconds. That right there is how long it takes for it to make one rotation. So one rotation, that's the time for one rotation. We don't care to rotate at one time, we wanna rotate it only one twelfth of a time. So let's now divide this by 12, or times by one twelfth, like I did in the last one. Uh, and you're actually gonna find that that's 1.58, seven, oops, not seven, five, sorry, seven, three, times 10 to the negative four seconds. That's how long it takes to make a 1 12th rotation. So that's how long it takes to make a 1 12th rotation. We know what the speed of that is. We want to find out the distance that the light would travel in that amount of time. Let's just throw that into that old equation up there. So we have uh, 3.00 times 10 to the eight equals D over our time, which was 1.5873 times 10 to, the, 10 to the negative four. Multiply that over, you're going to get D equals 47,619 meters. But remember, that's there and back. There and back. We don't want there and back. We just want how far it is there. So let's now take that number and divide it by two and then uh, write it with the proper number of sig digs, which is actually gonna be three. I wouldn't count this whole 12-sided thing to be sig digs. Like, it'd be kind of silly to say, oh, it's 12 and a half sided, so I, I won't count that in sig digs. I'm gonna count the answer as three sig digs here. Uh, D is therefore gonna be 2.38 times 10 to the four meters. That would be your final answer. And if you prefer that in kilometers, you could say D equals 23.8 kilometers, but whatever, whatever floats your boat. All right, we're done. Wow, that was, uh, that was something. There was a lot of calculations. There were a lot of uh, formulas in that one. Uh, what I want you to do is work on the worksheet page 11 to 14. Again, that is in the EMR notes package part one. Uh, you will have to be doing those questions in there. That is the only practice that we're going to get. Uh, and I would highly advise that you do those sooner rather than later. Uh, anyway, if you wanna check the answers, remember the answers are also posted on the uh, Google Classroom page, but keep in mind that they were created by a different teacher. They weren't made by me. The other teacher is another teacher in our own district, though. Uh, so his methodology might be a little bit different, but the answer should be fine. But again, if you see anything weird in there, please contact me. You know how to reach me. Uh, anyway, best of luck, guys. Talk to you soon.